Dahlia Bourgeois. Uh, sounds mm-hmm. like a French uh, Dahlia Bourgeois. Yes. So she has a daughter who has some um, um, also abilities. So it's telepathy tapes if you come across. Mm-hmm. Dr. H- um, Hennessy Powell, who has been um, studying savants. So it's children who have autism, but they also have these extraordinary abilities that they, for example, have um, um, photographic memory mm-hmm. or they can do math really well. Um, or they demonstrate like language capacities that they have never come across. And um, so her daughter, um, uh, Lido, she found out at 11 years old. So so she has other children as well. And at, But only at 11, she started speaking with her daughter through a spelling board. So these children are called um, spellers. Uh, and I think there's a new term that they're uh, would like to introduce because non-speakers is incorrect because they can speak through spelling in a way they're communicating through spelling through spelling so they have a board because they have a difficulty coordinating their body so they they can kind of punch the letters on the board one at a time so it takes time there's a lot of controversy in the medical or more science field for a long time that they're saying that the person who has the spelling board is helping them to spell, but Mm. it's unrealistic. You know, there are so many um, situations and things that these children know that are just extraordinary. And they can't can't actually say the words. So Dahlia is learning to speak now. Mm. So she's uh, now several years into spelling and she, I believe she was able to sing before some because it's a responsible different part of the brain is responsible for Mm -hmm. music and singing Mm -hmm. so she was able to sing but not to say the words because it takes a lot of coordination it's a different part of the brain that's responsible for it so they are able to um to um spell and they say for example there was one and teachers who work with these children with uh what called spellers uh they are unable sometimes to tell their organizations that they're teaching, f- you know, for, mm-hmm. uh, or sometimes parents that they're communicating telepathically with these children what? because it's not accepted. And also parents want children to talk, of course, you know, they want them to be integrated into the world the same mm-hmm. way that parents right. are, right? So they want, them, they want them to ad- be able to adapt and fit into the rigid framework of yes, society. Yes, beautifully said. Exactly. So we've got a concept how we should be, mm-hmm. and that's what they want. Um, you know, that's I guess the, not just the parents; it's the society expectation, and and we are trying to fit in as best we can. Mm-hmm. So these children. So for one example, um, that's in um, Kay Dickens. Mm-hmm. So Diana Hennessy Powell is a researcher has been doing this for many many years. Uh, and uh, she worked in Harvard as well. And um, she had a a very interesting story. If you can speak with her, that'd be extraordinary as well. And um, so so one of the stories that parents, sorry, the teacher um, brought bought biscuits, but brought one biscuit to the classroom, to these children, but forgot the others in the car. Uh, and so she gave the children these biscuits in this um, um, in this classroom, and one boy came up to her and drew the biscuit that she left in the car because it was like a donut shape. So how could he possibly know? Wow! And and this is just like one you know example, but it, it's just continuously all the time, and. Um, Kai Dickens is a, she's a producer, mm-hmm. and they're just filming a film with these children and parents, and you really hear their stories. What parents had to go through, where the you know the people, the experts that they go to, they say there's nobody there in their child. Like there's nobody home. Yeah, and you know parents um, feel otherwise, and when they discover that their children actually can talk and they're in there and more so they are they are and have been communicating with them all the time so they they would actually drop things into their mind and for example you can't hide 
any food in the house because no, they know exactly where the food is and how many pieces are left. So you can't say, I don't have it because the children know every, everything you think about. Wow. And when the parents start to pick up on that, uh, they say that this feeling of this um, communication that is telepathic, it's more um, whole, more experiential. So for example, one of the mothers says that uh, Thanksgiving, like if I tell you Thanksgiving, you would have your own concept that came through experience. And for mm -hmm. me, because I don't have the experience, I'll have, I know what, you know, something that I have read or watched. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but for her, when she hears that concept from her child, she gets the smell, the love, the hugs, um, the food, you know, she will get the whole embrace, the excitement of being together. All of that will just flood over her, not just word. Like telepathically? Yes. And then she would, wow. from that, she will put it into a word. And moreover, <laughs> these children are actually meeting each other, what they call the hill. The hill? The hill. So they talk to each other. Um, they sometimes even meet at the specific time and they know each other. And then if sometimes the, I think there were stories that in Kai Deacon's uh, telepathy tape radio show that she's created on Spotify, you can listen, mm -hmm. and YouTube, I think now. And um, uh, they um, almost like plan to meet through parents, those who start to spell, they want to go to certain places and then meet those children that they met telepathically in this virtual space called The Hill. And it's a, a virtual space. Yes, so it's telepathic. It's not virtual computer. Right, right, right. But it's, it's somewhere uh, out there in it's, the ether. Um, yeah, conscious, you know, it's where they meet. And they can meet people they've never met physically before? Yes, yes. And some, uh, so some conundrums that are challenging is that some children that don't have spelling ability yet, or their parents can't get to it, or they don't know their child can have it, right? Because not all parents um, have their access to this um, particular method, or mm -hmm. maybe they don't know about it, maybe because it's so taboo, but it's been for many decades existing. But the speech society, has rejected it as a valid method. Mm. And also there is this um, uh, pressure, you know, for children to be able to speak. But does it matter if they can communicate, <laughs> you know? Right. Like if you can communicate with your child, of course you'd want to communicate in any way possible. Mm -hmm. Right? Totally. <laughs> Sorry, it, I'm yeah, flooding no, you with information. It, yeah, no, it, it um, so you asked me this question. You about make a him. good point, it, mm. but it, but yeah, no, obviously it, it is right. If if you're a mother and you, you have a child that's say three years old and you're surrounded by other mothers who have kids in the same age, you guys they, typically, in my, at least in my experience, is like mm. the mothers are always trying to like bounce ideas off each other. How is your child doing? Figure out how my child's doing compared to all these other kids. Get, get them together, create a little community, and like you know usually you just in the society that we live in you you would expect your kids to start learning specific words at a certain age and stringing words together at another age and then like okay well now uh my kid's about to be four we got to put them in like kindergarten and you know this is just what we do in the society so it's like to step outside of that is kind of like uncomfortable for a lot of people and if and if kids start to develop in new ways like that's got to be so much more unsettling or uncomfortable for people if it's not because it's it's it sounds just at face value for somebody who's not initiated yes. into any of this stuff it sounds kooky yes exactly but these children are extraordinary so they they apparently they teach each other so once the one child uh, acquires the ability they can meet on the hill mm -hmm. and they can teach each other that skill they, they have their own teachers. We, we can only hear from them what these teachers are. Some describe them as angel-like. Some describe them as, um, you know, they come in form. So what is it about these children specifically? Is there, is there something that we can, that we know about them psychologically or developmentally that 
um, makes them all unique. So it's um, so every child is different, just like we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are put into one category in school, like you know, as we're going through. But in a way, we learn differently, we communicate right. differently, we pick up information through our perception differently, we mix it differently. But we are taught that we are the same, that you see the same orange as I do. Right. No, we don't. Right. So these children are so unique. That's why it's so challenging because their physical ability differs, their cognitive ability differs, their emotional regulation differs, they physically on how they um, you know, work with their body. So this erratic movements that they have when you know, they perceived as abnormal, they're actually trying to feel the edge of their body because they don't feel their body. Whoa. So when they're doing this, you know, strange movements that look to us unsocial or inappropriate or, you know, whatever we've learned conceptually to see, they're actually trying to literally get into their body to feel the edges. So when some when they're learning to spell, if somebody touches them before they start spelling, they feel more grounded and in the body so they can then focus better mm. and they can make that one directive mo movement which takes a lot of focus and concentration they also now do tablets they do it on tablets mm -hmm. once they start advancing from uh, a board but is there is there um they're all non-verbal right um well interestingly so dahlia's daughter yeah lido she's learning now to pick up Okay. So it's almost like the language working a different pathways, mm -hmm. but uh, of course, it takes so much effort to say something, to string that together because it's new new neural pathways. And of course, we can remap our neurology, mm -hmm. and so she it's harder, and uh, so some of the children that parents have learned to telepathically communicate with them. So could you imagine so many discoveries? Their children, you know, are, are actually there. They're very clever. They learn history from you. So they, you watch a film, they can talk to you about that film. You've learned something. So when you put them in the classroom, they're reading everybody's mind. <laughs> so, yeah. So if they go into a proper school, they would read what the teacher knows. So taking them out of school just because of how they behave to us is actually not necessarily good. It's harder for the class management. And of course, you can't talk to the child in the same way. But, you know, uh, I'm not an expert in it. I'm just communicating the fascination, the extent of what we don't know about the extrasensory perception mm -hmm. and our, our capabilities. That's why when that came out, for me, it starts to explain some of the questions that I have that you know, we were not allowed to test in our scientific methodology. <laughs>